All right, we should be recording now. So welcome to Hello World. This week, we're going to talk about unit testing, uh, why you want to write unit tests. Uh, also, some other things about testing, like integration testing and uh, ways you can structure your code to be, to be uh, more easily tested. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, and let's go ahead and jump into it. All right, so what is a unit test? Well, a unit test is just a test of a single unit. That's why it's called a unit test. Uh, this can be a couple of different things, but usually it's gonna be you test a single function or you test a class or like a module. So some languages do like a module type thing. Um, you, you pick basically a small smallest component of your application and you test that on its own. And the reason that you want to try actually doing this is if you test each piece on its own, it's easy to see if that particular piece is the cause of problems. Whereas if you try to test your whole application in one go and it doesn't work, well, clearly, you know, there was a problem somewhere, but there is uh, no guarantee that you know exactly what it is that's causing the problem. So that's sort of the, the idea behind a unit test is you can scope out and make sure each piece is working independently. And that should give you a, a relatively good assurance that the whole thing is going to work uh, as, a, as a machine together. Here's some other reasons you wanna use unit tests. So most of the time people are already testing in a, in a non-automated way. So if you've, if you've gone to like, if you're in an intro programming class of some sort and you get test cases from your professor, right? And you take those test cases and you run your code and then you compare your test case to their test case. You're doing testing, uh, it's just not automated. You're just doing manual testing. You know, you type the things and you see what comes out. And if you're only doing it once or twice, it's not a big deal. But if it's something that you're running many, many times, then moving towards like a more automated solution is going to save you a lot of time. If you can just, the machine can run the tests and compare that the output's the same a lot quicker than you can. So that's, if you're already testing like manually and you're doing it a lot, unit tests are a great way to sort of move that to an automated system. Also, they save you time debugging. I don't know, for anyone who was here last week uh, when we, we were working on uh, one of my personal projects and doc talking about documentation, uh, we were actually updating, refactoring some code to improve it, to make it a little more readable. Well, I inadvertently, when I was doing that, I made a mistake in my, my refactoring so it didn't actually work still correctly. But luckily, my unit test suite caught it. So when I ran the tests, things that were supposed to work didn't work. And then you can tell because the test didn't work that it doesn't work the same way as it did before. So and that saved you a lot of time debugging because imagine if I didn't notice that and I just committed it. And then, you know, a month down the road, I noticed, hey, this thing doesn't work right anymore. I wonder why. It's not going to be as easy for me to figure out, oh, this was this particular thing that caused it. If you have unit tests and you can, you can verify that, okay, stuff that worked before still works now. And that's when we, you see this prevents regressions. That's what we're talking about when we say, when we talk about unit tests, uh, or when we're talking about that sort of behavior that if it works now, you want to make sure it continues to work in the future and that future updates don't break what you already have. That's what preventing regressions is about. So if you write unit tests, they work now and you keep running them in the future and they continue to work, then you have a fairly good guarantee that your code is going to continue to work as you expect. So yeah, unit tests. All right, so let's break down what the parts of a unit test actually are. Basically, you've got three things. Um, the setup, so you're going to set up your unit, do any initialization you need. Um, we'll see that. And usually, like, you don't have to strictly adhere to this, but this is sort of the phases I think of when I'm writing a test. Then you want to actually like use the thing or whatever unit it is, you want to use that. And then at the very end, you're going to make assertions about the behavior or, or some state to try to figure out, okay, did things go as I expected? All right, so setting up the unit. Um, so here we have sort of an example in just a basic sort of JavaScript here. So we're writing our test, this test, we're gonna test my function. Uh, in this case, we're gonna test this put in box function that we import from somewhere else. So we're gonna import that. Um, to set up, we're going to want to have a name because what this put in box function is intended to do is put a string inside of like use. There are actually special characters called box drawing characters that you can use to draw boxes out of text, uh, which is pretty cool. 
But so that's what this function is supposed to do. It's supposed to box something up. So if we want to, to like test that to make sure it works, well, we're going to need something to box up. So we initialize that. Sometimes you need to make objects or things, but in this case, we don't really need to. All right. Um, then we want to actually use it. So to use it, we're just going to call the function and pass in the, the string, pretty simple, and then store the result. If you have a class or something, you might need to do, you know, call a method on it or call a few methods. It doesn't always have to be that you do a single thing. So for most functions, calling it once is probably all you need to do. But if you're testing a class or a module, then you might want to call a few functions or do a few different things, set some properties, whatever you need to do in order to get a consistent test. And we'll see some more examples of this, so don't worry. The last thing you want to do is make assertions. So there's different ways you can do this. Um, I'm just going to sh I'm showing the, these examples with sort of a uh, vanilla just assert function. Many languages have this built in. You may need to import it. Um, and if your language doesn't provide it, then you can get a library that'll do it for you. Basically, this very basic assert, and there are better ones that can do fancier things. We'll see. But this very basic assert uh, basically just asserts that the condition inside of it is true. So in this case, uh, we're gonna we're gonna assert that oh this should be a result here, but we're gonna assert that our result is equal to a the box in name, right? So this is what we intend it to look like. Uh, so we're gonna call the function store it in result. This should be result, and then compare it to this is what we think the output will be. So that's sort of the three steps. You initialize things, uh, then you actually use the function, and then you make assertions about what you got back or some state or various different things. That's sort of the very, very basic anatomy of a unit test. All right, so let's actually walk through in depth, like how more in depth, sort of see another example and how you would do this for a function you already have. So let's, let's take just a simple Fibonacci function to start. So if you're familiar with Fibonacci, uh, great. If not, it's not too complicated. Basically, it's a sort of recursive function. So the way it works is if like the, so the zeroth Fibonacci number is zero, then the first Fibonacci number is one. And then after that, every Fibonacci number is just the sum of the two previous ones. So for example, the second Fibonacci number is one plus zero, right? That's what's going on down here. So it kind of recursively calls itself. So, okay, the second one will be one. And then the third Fibonacci number will be the two previous, which is one plus one. So that'll be two. And the next one will be two plus one, which will be three. And then three plus two, which is five. And you know that'll continue and continue. So this is sort of a very basic function. We just take in one parameter, the number that we want to do for this Fibonacci. And then we'll call the function recursively in order to get our solution with our base cases. So how can we, how can we write a test for this? Well, first, let's set things up. Um, so in this case, another, again, it's a function. So the setup's pretty simple. You just want to define a, uh, a variable to store like what you're going to pass into the function. You don't have to do this. We'll see that you can actually simplify this, especially for like very simple functions like this. But if you have a more complicated situation with like a class or, or a module or something like that, or even just a complicated function, it might be wise to set up sort of each argument independently before. So it's very easy to read the test and see what's happening. Okay, so we set up n equals six. Yeah, we don't actually need to, we could, we can just pass in six, we'll see that later. All right, then we use it. So again, we're gonna call Fibonacci on this number six and get back the result. Okay, simple enough. And then our assertion. So we're gonna assert that the sixth Fibonacci number is eight. And so what this assert actually does is if it's true, then the test will pass. If it's false, then this assert is going to say some error like result wasn't eight or whatever. And you can use it to, for any condition. So it's not just comparing numbers. You could compare two strings. You could compare objects. Um, you could check that a specific, you, could, you can check that something's not equal. So maybe you have a situation where, for whatever reason, you want to make sure that the result of this function is never this one thing. So you, may, you check that it's not equal. Uh, that's something else that you can do. But in a, the assert is just checking that whatever the condition inside here is true. OK, so that's sort of how you'd apply this to like a Fibonacci function. And here's how I was talking about how you can simplify this. So you don't need to necessarily do these three. You don't need three lines of code necessarily for every test. Right in this case, I think it's pretty obvious that we're passing six into Fibonacci and then we're checking if the result is eight. 
So if you want to inline those things and just say, okay, assert that fib of six is eight and do this, this is totally fine. Um, but I'm just, the reason I delineate those out is because for more complicated cases, writing everything in line is probably going to get pretty messy. So you're, you're going to want to go for a, more of an approach like this, where you kind of set things up first. But yeah, that's simple enough. Does that make sense to everyone? I know we had some people joining in late here. All right, cool. Okay, the other thing you wanna do is you usually don't wanna just assert one case. So, so let's take a look back here. Um, here, we're checking that, that Fibonacci of six will give us eight. But just because that one case works doesn't mean that other cases will work. Uh, so you wanna do a variety of different cases and how you choose these, um, you generally wanna choose cases that you think might fail. Like you don't wanna choose a bunch of cases that are very similar. So uh, for example, I know six is going to use the recursive functionality. So let's test that by using, we'll do six. That way we can test to make sure that the whole recursive call thing works. And then zero and one are both base cases. So it's probably smart to test those to make sure that there's no typos and that that all worked correctly. Um, and then also, you should think about like putting in like really big numbers. So like int max or int min, really small numbers, or even just negative numbers. Um, you know, always try a positive and negative and zero for integer arguments, if that's something that's in your function contract. Uh, so, you know, you might say this, this in some, some sense is sort of an unfair test, depending on how you have your, uh, your documentation for your function set up. So if you specifically say in your, Fibonacci documentation, right? So you write a doc string above your function and you say that the, you have to pass in zero or greater, then okay, you don't need to test values that aren't passed in because anyone using it should read the doc string and know that, okay, if you pass in negative, who knows what's going to happen. But if you don't, if you don't say that and you just take in any integer uh, or any number, like also something we, I didn't show here, but a floating point number, what will happen if we pass that in? Uh, the, you need to actually, you need to, you should test all of these cases that you can think of. Um, and there's like, you can look up lists of like sort of all the different things you should consider, you should consider for different types, but generally a negative, a positive, a big, a small, uh, you know, a floating point. If you try all those things and it works, then the idea is that if all of those things worked, even though we can't test every possible number, probably the rest of them will work. There's no reason to believe they won't work. Uh, so that's, you definitely want to do more assertions than just one because one test doesn't really prove much of anything. Okay, test-driven development. So this is related to testing. Um, if you've ever heard of TDD or, or BDD, it's a very similar thing. The idea behind test-driven development is you actually write tests before you actually write any software. So the way you would start with your application is literally by writing a test. Or if you have a new feature you want to implement, you go and write a test. And the idea behind this is it forces you to think about, okay, what, what am I going to need to do in order to make this, this, uh, this new feature or this, this program? Like, what is this? What are my sort of requirements for it? And if you sort of think of those in advance, instead of just jumping straight into code, you're more likely to write uh, concise and, and useful code. So the way this would work is before we even conceived of writing the Fibonacci function, we're going to write our testing function. And we're going to say, okay, this is the behavior that I want out of this function. This is what I expect this function to do. So when I call this, it does this. When I call this, it does this. And you know, maybe for this, you, you, let, you say that, okay, whenever we do a lower number, we're just going to return one anyway, or we're going to return negative one to indicate an error, or we're going to throw an exception. There's different things you can do but you basically delineate what behavior you want before you start writing any code. Then you come and you try to fulfill the tests that you've written. So you're gonna write these tests. It's not going to work. If you run the test, it's going to fail for all of them because it's not defined. And then once you define it, well, it's not going to actually do these things until you write the code. So you write the code out and then you run your tests and you hope that your tests turn green and that everything works properly. And if it doesn't, it's okay. You go back and you, uh, you might have an error in your test. So sometimes you can have a problem in your test, just a typo or something uh, like I had in an earlier slide, but sometimes you, your code doesn't actually work properly. It's not so much that it's the, the reverse. So there's a question in the chat that's saying it's so it's the reverse of the first method. 
it's not so much that it's the, I mean, I guess in a sense it is the reverse. It's just sort of a different methodology to testing. Most, most teams that use tests encourage you to do test-driven development. And I encourage you to do it too. If you're going to write tests, doing test-driven development is a good thing to do. But sometimes you, you're retrofitting tests onto code that already exists. So if you're a project and you're like, hey, you know what? I think testing is good. We should add testing to this. Then obviously it's too late to do test-driven development except for new things. Um, so you'd write tests after the fact. But yeah, I would generally, if you can, doing it in the reverse order. So it is really the reverse. Doing it in the reverse order where you start with the tests is better because then you won't have to think about, uh, it, it, make, it forces you to think about exactly what you want the function or module or class to do before you have to start thinking about, uh, before you actually try to implement it. Because a lot of times what will happen if you do it the other way is you'll implement something and then you, you write a test that doesn't really test very much. And we'll see more examples of this later, but hopefully that makes some sense. So the reason that you want to do test-driven development is it keeps the it keeps your scope down. So when you write tests, right, you're not going to write one gigantic module that does everything at once because that would require you to write a huge amount of tests. So you're only going like Fibonacci, very simple, right? It only it calculates a number. It's it's relatively straightforward. So and by writing those tests, we make sure that we don't pull in any extra functionality we don't need to do, just sort of the very basics. Also, you know when you're done, because when your tests pass, you can maybe refactor it if you want to clean it up a little bit. But once your tests pass, you know that it works. You don't have to like go and look at your, because sometimes you look at your code and you're like, hmm, I think this might work or hopefully this works. Well, if you have tests that are running, um, then you'll know if it works. And like a common setup that people use is they'll have like two displays or just one large display that's kind of split up into multiple windows. And on one window, you can have your tests continuously running. And so the idea with this is it will show your tests will be failing, failing. And then when you finally get it working correctly, your tests will start on your other display will start working correctly. And you kind of get instant visual feedback that things are working as you intend, which is really nice. Um, it also feels really good too, because you see like a screen of all these things failing that are red. And then when you update your code and save the file and it reruns the test, it all turns green and it's, it's very, uh, very gratifying. Then also the other thing to consider is um, this third point here. If you don't do test-driven development and you just say, ah, I'll write the test afterwards. Usually what ends up happening is you forget or you're just like, ah, I, I think it's gonna be fine. I don't need to write the tests. So if you write tests first, then it makes sure that you actually will do it. So that's, that's another thing. Okay, so let's actually see a demo of this. So I'm going to share my screen. We're going to be working with uh, the same project that we were using last week. So let me get everything set up and I'll put the link to this in the chat. So this is a, if you were here last week, this is a, a programming language project. Uh, All right, if you go to that URL, you should be able to, let me click the link to make sure it works correctly. Yep, okay. So yeah, you can click that and go and see the, the documentation on how to download. It's very simple. You basically just clone and do NPM install. Um, and so we were working on this last week, but let's actually look into implementing a feature. So first let's just sort of see like what we can do. So if you wanna actually get this, I need to do git clone github.com and it says all this in the docs but and just clone this whole url dot git or you can leave the dot git off as well and so that'll create a folder for you you can head over into that folder and then run npm install and that will uh, install all the dependencies for the project and then you should be good to go all right so let's actually head into this, or let's actually run this project so you can sort of see. There's a few different modes you can run this in. If you run just npm start, you'll get a, a REPL. So just like you can you know, run Python or Node and just get a REPL for those, um, you can get that. So you can do, uh, you can do math. So if you wanna, you wanna do math with various things, that's something you can do. Um, let's see, what else can you do? I think you can do string concatenation. 
I haven't checked on this in a while. Okay, that works. So you can concatenate strings with plus plus. I don't think single plus will work, but yeah. Um, you can write functions. So if we want to write like a simple sum function, might look a little bit different than you're used to, but it basically works the same. So if you want to write a function and add things, uh, that's another thing you can do. There's, there's various features. But one thing I want to point out is in this particular, um, I noticed a bug the other day that we're going to actually fix. And it's going to require us to add a, another module, or at least that's the way we're going to solve it for the purposes of this workshop. Um, and so this bug has to do with a, a feature that I have in my language. So one thing you can do in this language is when you use the equal sign, there's two ways to make variables. You can make them with the var keyword and then a, a backwards arrow. And the backwards arrow is just less than in the hyphen. So my font makes it into a backwards arrow, but it looks mostly like a backwards arrow. Um, even if you just type in, you don't have a special font. So you can, you can store things this way. So let's say we want to put five into variable A. Okay, and then we look in A, A has five. That's great. Um, but we can also use the equal sign, just like you would in a sort of a more traditional language. And when you do that, it creates, it does the same thing. It makes a variable, um, but you don't need to use the var keyword. And the other thing is it makes it immutable. So that means you can't change it later. So we can change this. So if we want to make this like 10, for example, okay, we can do that. But if we try to reassign this to 10, it'll say cannot redefine immutable variable B. So once you define something with equals, it's forever and always going to equal that. But uh, this doesn't necessarily hold in, in certain cases. And so this comes up, let's, let's write a simple file. Let, let's write a little test for this. So where this comes up is with functions. So if you have a, a variable on the outside, let's say we have an A on the outside. So we have an A out here that's equals five. And then you have a sum function. Um, right, so this inner function here has a, uh, a different, a different like scope of existence. This a, they're not the same a, right? So if we run like if we run this, we can actually pass in the a and you know ten or something like that. So if we actually should be able to run it like that, I think. Nope, variable sum is not defined. No, it didn't like that. Maybe if I do it like that. might just need to use the REPL. There are a lot of bugs in this, but I'm still working on it pretty actively. Um, but if you have, so if you set A equals to five here and then you do a, a sum, then the A inside here is going to be a different A. So like we could pass in six for that, right? And then this will give us back 13, okay? So it's, it's not the same A. And so we need a way to manage that. And the way we do that, as we saw last week, is through sort of this the scope file. But one problem that this leads to is in order to support this behavior, um, we have a weird issue where if you assign, so here's what I noticed, because I was I didn't notice this for a long time, but if you set something to A, and then you set A, you store A into something else, okay, it's all good, but then it will let you uh, reassign into A. And this is pretty interesting. And so, so why does this actually happen? Like, why does it let you, so A will be six and then B will be five. Why does this happen? Um, and so I thought about this for a long time because I was, was very confused as to how this is possible. And the reason this happens is because of the way this scope file works. So if you remember last week, coincidentally, we were actually writing documentation for this. Um, it, it's not because B isn't still immutable. It has to do with the way that the scoping actually works. So the way that the program will work is it creates a, the whole program is wrapped inside of one, one scope. So like if we go to, I know our file didn't work. Um, <laughs> but if we, if we write a file like this, right? And we define, every time you define a variable, it makes a new scope. So you can sort of think of like scope one starts here, like here, let's, yeah, scope one starts starts here, and then it ends at the end of the file. 
And then as soon as you define a new variable, that, uh, that leads to another scope starting. So we have that, and then we have the end of that, okay? So this is sort of the situation you end up with. And so because of this, what happens is if you, if you try to reassign, um, and really it has nothing to do with assigning into that. If you, if you assign a, if you try to reassign a here, it will work because then in this scope, we'll have B and this local A. So B will be six in here and A will be six in here. And then out here, there's a different A that is actually five. No, B doesn't, well, as soon, so as soon as you assign, yeah. So if we go back to our, if we go back to our tests, Basically, as soon as you sign, assign a new variable, it makes a new scope. So the immutability only works if you try to like immediately reassign. So if we do a equals five and then a equals six, it doesn't work. But as soon as we assign something else, then you'll be able to reassign the previous thing. And then this one won't work, but anything before that, because each version is sort of, it's creating a new scope in the data structure and, and it sort of ignores, it doesn't look into the higher, up into the higher scopes to see if it was already defined recently. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a complicated problem, but it does, it, it's the reason I'm bringing this, I'm using this, even though sort of a convoluted example, is because it's, it's, it's going to be a good example for testing. So we have that, we have this problem. Um, so let's remove this. Let's remove all these files that we don't need. Okay, so the tests in my project are just stored in the test folder. So if you head over to there, You'll see some tests. There's three sort of main testing files, the interpreter test, scope test, and tokenizer test. We're going to take a look at scope test. So this is sort of um, a, this is using a testing framework. So if you saw in sort of the, uh, whatchamacallit, the announcements about this workshop, we're using this project using the, the Mocha, Mocha JS uh, testing framework. There's different ones you can use. Most languages have multiple. Um, just pick one that's fairly well supported. They all tend to have fairly similar syntax and some have nice features, others have fewer nice features, but you get different things. Um, rather than just basic assert though, almost all of them give you stuff that's better than just assert. So uh, in order to like give you more information about what failed, you have these describe and this it, and you use this sort of interesting syntax. So you do describe and you're gonna sort of describe the whole set of things that you're testing. And then you have a function inside of that. And then you have this it, and you can, it sort of reads through. So you can say it should retrieve values with no parents. So what this is saying is if we have a scope that doesn't have any parent scopes, uh, which it doesn't because we didn't pass any in, um, then we should be able to retrieve values successfully. Because apparently this didn't work at one time for me. Or this is just when I originally wrote up the class. And then it should return null if the value doesn't exist. So we create a scope. And then we try to get something out of it that doesn't actually exist. Well, that should give us null. And notice we don't have to do um, like equals equals or anything like that. We can instead do this sort of expect scope.get a to equal null. And you get it. So Mocha in particular has like a lot of these nice sort of Englishly sounding um, ways to do. And you can also test for things like, like uh, throwing an error. So like if you, if instead of doing null, maybe you wanted it to throw throw an error, then you can say, expect this to throw. And then if it throws, it will pass. And if it doesn't throw, it'll say this function didn't throw an error um, or didn't return the right thing or whatever. Um, like we can see, like, let's change it to, like, let's say change this to 50, okay? What will happen? Um, so you'll see the test will fail. So to run the test, you just run npm t and that will run the tests. Um, okay, so you can see we have 103 tests, 102 of them passed. And then this one I just changed just failed. So it says, and you see, it gives us all that information. So that's why you sort of use a framework. It gives you sort of this nice view. Um, and then and when you have an error, it gives you a nice sort of message about that. So we're getting assertion error, expected 49 to equal 50. And so it expected 50, but it was actually 49. And that's just because I just changed this. So we expected it to equal 50, but it's 49 because it actually is 49. So. Let's change that back. And if you run, if you if we look now, all the tests are working fine. There we go, 103 passing. Okay, 
So, but the problem that we're running into is that when we assign something, we should be getting an error when we assign, when we try to reassign to an immutable value. So let's write a test for that. So it should throw an error when reassigning to an immutable value. So let's do our setup. So the first thing we need to do, let's get our source. So in this case, um, what, what code are we going, what's like the most basic code that we can write to make this break? Well, we, can, we saw it already, a equals five, and then just assign this to something, b equals 10, and then a equals six. So that's our source code. Um, all right, so we take that. That's sort of our setup. We don't really need to do a whole lot. We also, oh, we should make a, a, um, a basic scope would probably be good, right? So let's make a scope. And then we can actually interpret this, actually run this. So in order to run it, um, we need to import, or the easiest thing to do, there's different ways we can do it, but the easiest thing to do will be to import from our interpreter. So to actually, oh, let's go back. Okay, so if we go into our source folder and our interpreter, um, sort of the thing that we need is we need this, this STL eval. It'll take in a string that we're gonna evaluate, which is that's our code that we're gonna use. And then the scope, and we'll just make up a new scope because we don't need anything special going on. Um, so, and we'll run that. So we need to import this STL eval from interpreter. So let's go back into tests, um, go back into scope. So STL eval. So we import that, great. We, so we now have STL eval available to us. Um, we've made a new scope, that's great. So now we can run STL eval. So that was our setup, right? We set up our new scope because you need a scope in order to evaluate anything, even if it's just an empty one to start. Um, and then we have our string of stuff that we're gonna write. So let's actually evaluate this. So we just pass in our source, pass in our scope. Um, and then we expect that this will throw. So what we need to actually do is wrap this in our expect and then wrap it inside of another function so that this inner function will be the part that throws. And then we can put to throw at the end. So we're saying, okay, here's a function right here we're giving you, call this function, but fully expect that it's not going to work. And so we're gonna expect it to throw and we can actually even specify exactly what we want to be thrown if we think that's something we wanna do but we probably don't really need to do that for this example. And then before you start writing any actual code to fix it, make sure that your test doesn't pass. Make sure that it actually does fail. Cause like, it's possible that you like by mistake, you know, expect it to not throw or something, or you make, you do something wrong and then it, it actually is going, it's already passing before you do anything. Okay, so now it fails, right? So that's good. It doesn't work. Let's actually take a look at how we can fix this. So um, if we head over back to our source and we poke around in scope, the problem ultimately has to do with when we look up a value. So this lookup function is how we are looking up a value. So we look up a value, um, but it's not actually, it's not looking up. It's when we try to redefine it. So this function is the one that should sort of, sort of go wrong. So if you look at this define function, we take in three things. We take in a, a key, that's like our variable name. So it'd be A or B in our case. Um, evaluated expression, this is like what is actually trying to be stored. So this will be like the five um, or the four or whatever number. In this case, we're using all numbers, but it can also be, you can see it can be other things. It can be a string, Boolean, um, a function, a list of things or nothing. But in this case, it's gonna be an int. And then whether it's immutable, which is a Boolean. And so currently the way this works is it checks, okay, in the current scope, is this key available? If it is, then we're gonna throw an error and we're gonna say, I can't redefine it. Otherwise, um, we set up a new scope and, and put that value inside of that. So what we, the problem here is that when we're checking to see if it's in the current scope, we really need to kind of check up to the most recent function. 
rather than just check the, the actual current scope. Because we, we do want sort of that behavior if we have a if we have a function, right? So if we have, let me let me see if I can write an example of this. So if we have if we have just values, so right now we're just doing this. And it lets us, this will let us reassign. Right, so this will let us reassign because it's, it's we're in a new scope. Um, but if we have a function, so we want this to not work. But if we have a function, like if we have, um, you know, some various function, and we assign this to some new value, we want this to be able to exist independently on its own. So that's the difficult set of constraints we have. We want within a sort of a function scope or within, if you could think of sort of a regular scope is just like a function scope. Within that, we want to be able to not, we don't want to be able to reassign, but if we're, if we create a new function that we want to be able to sort of shadow and create a, a new, like use the same name to mean something else. All right, so let's open up scope. There's actually a pretty simple way to fix this. And all we need to do is write a, make a new version of this scope class. So I'm just gonna call it local scope. And what this is going to do, it's going to be an extension of our regular scope. So it's basically the exact same as thing as a regular scope. But instead of um, when we do this has, instead of checking only, cause the way this has currently works is it looks up this bindings and sees, okay, because this bindings is just a table of all of our current variables. So right here, we it's a map or like a hash map, right? A hash map from the, uh, the string, the variable name to the whatever the value of it is and whether it's immutable. So that's what that is. But we don't want to just check the one that's in the current scope. We want to keep going until we hit a regular scope because we might have multiple of these local scopes created within a function just because of multiple, a new scope gets created every time there's a new variable declaration, which is, you could say maybe a bad idea, but that's how it is. Um, so all we really need to do is override this has function. So let's go up and grab that so that we have the right. So we just need to really override this. And so we can, first we can check this. So if our current, our current, uh, if our, if we look in the current scope and we have it, then okay, we can say we have it. Otherwise, we want to actually look. We want to look at our our parent scope. So. because our parent has the key. Um, let's see, property parent does not exist. Function lacking return statement. Okay, it's just kind of angry about a few things here. Okay, so if our parent has it, oh, I think this might be called something else, parent scope. Okay, so if, if our parent scope has the key, so first we're gonna check, okay, if we have it, we're still gonna return true that we have it. But if we don't have it, instead of just instead of just allowing it to be redefined, because currently the way it works is if you define something, if we don't have it, okay, just let it be defined in the current scope. But we want to keep checking until we hit the most recent regular scope. So we're going to ask our parent for it. So if our parent has it, um, then we're also going to say we have it. Otherwise, we'll just say false. No one has it. Um, okay, this needs to be else if. Then let's see, object is possibly null. Okay, it's mad because this dot parent scope could be null. So, so if it's not null, and if we have it, um, well, it didn't look at all, parent scope. Okay, all right, should be happy now. So if this dot parent, so if, if we have it, we have it. Um, otherwise, check and see if we have a parent. If the parent has it, then we're going to say we have it so that it doesn't, it won't let it get redefined and it will throw the error instead. And then if, if the parents, if none of our parents have it, then we're just going to say, okay, we don't have it. You can go ahead and define it. 
Fair enough. So if we run the test now, no, but it still doesn't work, right? Well, I think it has to do with the reason that we're not actually using this anywhere. So we just define this, but we're not actually using it. Um, that is very important. So what we need to do is um, when we actually define a new variable, instead of creating a new regular scope, we need to create a new local scope. That should get it working. Let's try this. Okay, and now it's all passing. And so what I usually do, um, and different people do it different ways. Some people will commit tests and then commit the, the stuff that fulfills the test. But I try to make sure that my tests are always passing for any commit. So I usually write the test, it doesn't work, write the code to fix it, and then commit that all in one spot. Um, and so that's another thing testing will help you with is it'll help you sort of write more concise, give you a better, if you, if you struggle with when and where to write commits, um, if you do a test, it sort of gives you a very easy, like, okay, the test works, therefore it's time to commit. Whereas normally it's kind of like, oh, should I do more work? You know, should I split this up? Like it's tough to sort of decide. So that's another thing that I've liked about writing tests. Okay, so, um, oh, you know, one thing we should probably do is, is test to make sure that it actually, it actually does have the intended behavior now, right? Um, manually just to make sure. But again, our, our unit test should have covered it, right? It didn't throw any errors, so it should work, but let's. Okay, so now you can see it says we can't redefine it. Great, and if we want to like actually enforce that it had this particular error, then that's something you can do, uh, at least in Mocha. So if we head over to our scope test, you can actually put this in the, inside here. And then like, you'll hear, I'll remove like one letter so you can see that it actually works. If we test this, it'll say expected to throw an error containing this, but actually got with the A and you can see what's the difference, it's that A. So you can actually like really get very specific about what you want the error to be. That way it's not just like any old error got thrown, but like actually like the right error. Okay, um, so that was that was a demo. Hopefully that made some sense. I know the issue is definitely somewhat complicated, but that was the sort of the simplest. I felt like I could boil it down to where you can sort of see how you'd use this in a real project. All right. Let's head back over to the slides. If there's any questions on that, feel free to put those in the chat. All right, you should be able to see the slides now again. All right. So a couple more things, um, integration tests. So. Integration tests are sort of the an analog to unit tests. So you, you use unit tests to test individual functions, or like in that case, we were testing like a um, an individual sort of class. But an integration test is like testing the full stack. So you want to make sure, okay, you've you've tested each sort of individual part, each individual feature seems to work okay. How does it all work? Does everything work together? And so what you do is um, you basically just write a test for like your whole uh, like the whole program sort of behavior that you would expect. And so like, this is an example, um, like this, so this tests a number of things. It might seem like it only tests Fibonacci, right? But what it tests is that, this is actually a test I pulled from this project. It tests function definitions, right? Because if the function definition doesn't work, this won't work. Um, it tests that you can compare things. It tests or, it tests uh, if else, it tests function calls, all of these different things it tests. Um, you know, the arrow syntax, everything, all of that stuff is getting tested. So this is more of an integration test because you're, you're not trying to test a specific component. It's like the full thing. You don't, you're not targeting anything in particular. And, uh, these are, these are valuable to make sure that your whole system works. Um, but also when they fail, it can be tough to figure out exactly why. So you don't want to write only integration tests because then you might get into a spot where like all of your tests fail because they're all integration tests because something very core is broken, but it's very difficult to figure out what it actually is. If you make sure you keep unit tests around to sort of target each individual thing, then you can see that, okay, these particular unit tests for this item failed. So it's probably that it doesn't work, not these other components. And it can sort of point you in the right direction of a bug, which is 
extremely valuable once you start to like scale to a bigger project. For small projects, testing isn't a huge deal because you can sort of manage it all in your head. But if you get, once you get to any sort of larger scale project, you're not gonna be able to think, keep track of or think of every possible cause that something, you know, of some possible bug. And so having tests to sort of guide you can be really helpful. All right, um, at this point, so that's basically your, your testing 101, right? Those are your, that's how you write tests. You saw a real world example, even if it's a little bit convoluted um, of how tests sort of work. But what are some common patterns when testing? What are some, what are some ways you can write your code to be more testable? Well, one of the toughest things, at least when I started writing tests, was dealing with dependencies. Uh, sometimes you have units that rely on other units, right? Your whole project is a bunch of different units that all rely on each other to some extent. Otherwise, they would be separate projects. Um, but you somehow have to disentangle this for unit testing. And so that's why a lot of people get caught up writing a bunch of integration tests because they can just let it all be coupled together and they can test the whole thing and that's fine. And that's better than nothing. Uh, but testing individual components is still important to make sure that, so again, for all those reasons I mentioned before. And so one of the toughest problems is how do you deal with this sort of case? So we have a function here, print total. Um, you can see it has a few different dependencies. So it relies in this get uh, cart contents, right? Because this is another function we're calling to get all the things in the, this sort of like for some shopping cart application, you know, online shopping or whatever. Um, and then what we do, so we get all those items, that's great. And we loop over them and print out each individual item and that item's price. And then we're gonna add up the prices so that we can get a total, you know, to sort of show, okay, this is how much you owe. Are you okay with this at the bottom or whatever? And so we're gonna print that out and this is great. Um, but, but how do we actually test this? If we try to follow our pattern, we run into some problems. So if we're gonna test this first, how do we set up the cart with test data and not like actually look for real data? Um, there's no real way. We'd have to like, one thing you can try to do is like intercept this function call somehow, right? So you can just be like, okay, you know, if print total ever calls this get cart contents, then instead of doing the real get cart contents, do our version of get cart contents. Um, and that is a thing you can do, but it's, it's, it's kind of not all languages can do it easily. And it's, maybe not always the best way to go. The other problem we have is our assertions. Um, how do we actually test that the things that were printed were actually the right thing? Uh, Cause this is just printing to the console. So like, I mean, obviously you can read it with your eyes and see, but you're sort of losing. I mean, I don't know about you, but if you have a project with a hundred tests you don't really want to read the console for each one manually to make sure that it did the right thing. It's kind of defeating the purpose. Um, and so that, that presents sort of another issue. The same thing comes up in other cases, like if you're storing to a database, right? If you take this and store it to a database, then are you going to manually go to the database and check and see if the database had the right thing stored into it? That might be fine for a small scale thing, but as you start to scale larger and larger, this just this isn't going to work. You're only one person. You know, it would take a whole team of people to verify hundreds of tests and it just really will slow you down. So we kind of run into some issues when we sort of follow our setup usage and then asserts pattern. Um, so yeah, I mentioned this, you can, you can use, there's different things you can do. You can use mocks. So instead of, instead of having the real function, you can like mock it out to do like something else to instead just always return some hard coded data and like try to intercept the calls. And you can, you can play games with that. Um, but it starts to get pretty annoying. And especially if you have a function that relies on a lot of things, right? Even this, this function is like relatively simple. It only calls one other function. Well, two, if you count console.log. Um, and it's just basically one for loop that adds up some numbers. And so, and we have to like pull out tools like intercepting calls to other functions and like mocking everything out. Uh, if you have a big function, you can really get into real trouble because you, you start having to mock like everything in your project and then it's it just, it gets very frustrating. Um, and so, well, how do you get around this? Uh, there's, there's a few ways you can do this. Um, and so these are some common patterns I encourage you to try to see in your own code and then refactor to be in, in a better way. So here's our, this is the same code from before. If you find yourself writing, if you find that it's very difficult to test your code. So you run into examples like this a lot. You're like, 
okay, I don't really know how to test what got logged or like, how do I intercept this get cart contents? And there's all kinds of other things that come up. Uh, it's often an indication that you've just written bad code. Um, and, you know, people don't like to hear it, but it happens. And that's why I kind of realized like, oh, I just, I don't write very good code. I write a lot of bad code. Um, and, but that's one thing that's great about testing. It helps you realize that. If your code is easily testable, it tends to be better or at least good code. So one thing you can do to try to make your code more testable and also just to have a better design is to decompose things. So notice we sort of have one function that's responsibility is a few things. It adds up the total, uh, then it prints things out. It has to like get the content. This is a lot of things for one function. Um, so try to decompose each of your functions to do quite literally one thing. There's no limit on how many functions you can have. They're, they're not completely free, but they're close to free. Um, so you might as well take advantage of it. So in this case, extract all the logic for calculating the total into its own function. That can be one thing. And then the printing, that can be a separate piece. And now you kind of, if you look at calculate total here, it's more testable because we now have this total that's being returned that we could do a comparison on instead of just kind of it all magically gets printed or whatever. Uh, print cart, we still have some troubles with though. Hopefully that makes some sense. So then we, for print cart, how we can sort of fix it is do something called dependency injection. And it might sound like a, a very you know, complicated term. It's mostly because in computer science, people who invent things like dependency injection uh, want to sound really smart. So they give it complicated names. But it's really a very simple idea. You have like you, there are things like dependency injection frameworks and stuff, but you don't need a framework to do very simple dependency injection. The idea is just that instead of, instead of like, in this case, right, we're calling this get cart contents. It's sort of just like a, a black box so that it just magically gets us the cart contents from somewhere else, right? And that's, we sort of have trouble with that because we have to like mock it out or something. Like, how do we do this? Dependency injection is basically just injecting things in through your arguments. So instead of like calling a function to get you the values from somewhere else, just pass the values in. And then when you call the function, you, you can use that function to get it from somewhere else. But it lifts the problem out of this current function and hands it off to somewhere else. And I mean, at some point, you're going to have to get those values still. But it improves the testability and also the, the conceptual model of this code a lot more. So if you look at this now, right, even calculate total was improved. So they both kind of got improved here. Instead of having this get cart contents that like, you know, grabs it from the screen or whatever, um, now we just pass the items in. And so when we test this, it's very easy to just make up an array of items and pass it in directly. We don't, we can completely bypass whatever get cart total was doing. Um, and the same thing for print cart, we can pass in the total we want printed uh, and then that was calculated with this presumably, but who knows, it could be calculated a different way. Maybe we decide to get rid of this function and do it some entirely new way later. That's fine, you can still pass it in. We inject it in through the arguments. And then we pass in our items instead of using the, the call to get to get them from somewhere else. That's, it reduces the magic. So you can sort of see very much, okay, you pass in items and then what's happening, very straightforward. Um, so dependency injection, this is something I see, uh, especially in, in certain languages, it tends to be a more common pattern like getting things or from, from other places or lots of methods that have no parameters. If you have a lot of, if almost all of your functions have no parameters, um, and don't return and they're all void return types, then you probably should consider doing some dependency injection. The last thing you can do is avoid side effects. So this, uh, I did a functional programming workshop earlier, I think it was at the hackathon, uh, so some time ago, so you may have not been there. But the idea behind this is that instead of running side effects like printing things, or in this case, we have printing. So printing is a very common side effect. Another one might be to hit the database, right? Store it to a database or write it to a file. Those are all side effects because they affect the state of the world, right? If you call, the best way to think about a like side effects is, would it be okay to just call this function like, you know, a thousand times? Is that gonna have any kind of like impact on anything else? Um, and like in this case, you'd see it would get printed lots of times. But if we call calculate total lots of times, think about that. It doesn't really matter. We pass in the items, we get the total back. We'll just get the same total back many times, but it doesn't affect the state of the world. 
nothing is getting printed out. The file isn't going to be super big. The database isn't gonna have a bunch of duplicate entries in it. There's no real effect on the outside world. Um, and so if we want to make cart to string like that, where it has what's called, it's a pure function. It doesn't have any side effects in it. What we can do is instead of printing out a string, we just return the string. So instead of printing anything out, we set up our string um, and then we append all of our items. Basically, it's the exact same thing we had before, but instead of logging stuff out, we're just gonna append all of that to our string and kind of build up what the, the message is supposed to look like and then return that. And this is a lot more testable too, because now here we would have had to like intercept the call to console.log somehow and like figure out what was being logged. But in this way, we can just pass in our things and get back a string. And now we have a string that we can compare to what we think it should be instead of something somehow having to like intercept console.log. Um, and so it's just a better design. And it's not just for testing, okay? There's other reasons you wanna do this too. Like here's, here's a great example. So here's sort of how you might use our final, final version here. We have some items, right? We have an apple, banana, cantaloupe. It costs four, one, three. That's great. We can calculate our total very easily. And then we can convert our cart. So pass in our items and our total and get a string that is a message. Um, now we can still console.log it out, right? We still have to do that someday. So it doesn't like, when we move that problem out of the out of the um, the this function and we just make this return, we still have to print it out. But now look at this, we can do other things with it. We can use it in our testing to compare. We can, maybe, maybe we wanna write it to the database. So we want to log it to the user, sure. But we also want to write it to our database so we have a record. And you know maybe this user has, we have a text messaging feature that we send people what they ordered whenever they check out. We can also send that out. There's other reasons why you might want to have a string other than just printing. And so by rewriting your function in this way, you've decoupled the printing from the actual generation of the message, which gives you more flexibility in the future. It's also not very difficult to do and just good design. So that's sort of, if you do these things, it makes your code more testable, right? If you look at this now, we can, before we had that mess, we had this one function that did everything. We're, we're looking at it like, okay, how can we tell if everything is computed right? We have to intercept function calls and mock things out. We don't need to mock anything out. Now we can just calculate the total of our items, make our own test data, calculate a total of that and check that it's right and assert that. Uh, or you can use whatever framework you're using. And it's a similar thing for the, um, the other example. I mean, you'll have to obviously write out the string. So that would take some time, but at least it's something you could actually do. Uh, so yeah, that's hopefully you can sort of see that doing it in this way where you, you go through and you kind of try to decompose the problem. So separate your functions that kind of do everything and the functions that do one thing. And then inject parameters don't use a bunch of methods that get things from other places or, or functions that are reading. This is why global variables are bad because you can't easily test when you have global variables because they might not be set to the right things unless they're in the production environment. If you don't use global variables and you just pass everything as an, as an argument, then when you test, you can pass in whatever you want it to be, much better. And then side effects, sort of the same reason. It's almost the same as a global variable, right? If you have files or a database or something like that, you just want to decouple that and you'll get other benefits like being able to use that, reuse that message for different things, or even in the future, entirely change how it works. Uh, so it's more testable. It's just better overall. Okay. Uh, so that's the end of my slides and all my demos. Do you have any questions about unit testing or any of the things we talked about? We talked about a couple of different things, but All right, it looks like no questions. Awesome. Let me stop recording then. And then please stick around and fill out our revised feedback form. Uh, it only takes a minute. If you're watching this from YouTube, you can just go to nighthacks.org slash feedback and you can still fill it out. It does really, really does help us. Thank you, Harold, for sending that in the chat.